I do think it's outrageous that he asked runners to get their phone numbers or provide him with their hotel room, um, with his hotel room details. And I do think it's bad that those runners did not feel um, that their concerns were taken seriously by the sound of it. Uh, I think this was also in, in your story in, in the Times uh, last weekend and on the dispatches. Um, you know, effectively, they were pimping for Russell Brand. Now, Russell Brand has spoken for the first time since rape and sexual assault allegations were made against him, revealed by The Times, The Sunday Times and Channel 4's dispatches a week ago. Brand, who has denied all allegations, posted a short video on social media last night in which he thanked followers for their support. He didn't address the investigation directly, but made claims about media corruption and censorship and what he calls deep state and corporate collusion. Well, it's not just Russell Brand who's been under the spotlight this week. Questions have been raised about the entertainment industry and in particular the role of the BBC and Channel 4. Well, let's speak to Lorraine Hegacy, who was controller of uh, BBC One between 2000 and 2005. Good morning. Morning. Um, thanks for being with us. First of all, your reaction to Russell Brand's video that he posted overnight. Are you, are you surprised that that was his approach? Not at all surprised. Um, I mean, Russell Brand's clearly decided to avoid doing any mainstream media interviews, uh, whether that's with uh, The Times or Sunday Times, who uh, led on this story along with Channel 4 dispatches. Um, and uh, as I understand, I heard on the BBC this morning, turned down all BBC approaches as well. So he just wants to broadcast in a disintermediated way so that he can put out his own version of the story and his own denials to his own particular following. What do you make of these new allegations that are in the Times today? I mean, one, for example, a researcher who worked on Big Brother on the, the spin-off show, which Russell Brand uh, presented, telling the Times that she was told to get attractive audience members. He would then look at the audience and decide which ones he wanted to have sex with. Uh, there's another piece in the Times today saying that um, Russell Brand's agent, uh, one of his agents, um, actually said that, um, that... I'm just getting her name because I know he had several agents. Hannah Chambers um, approached one comedian and said you just can't make allegations against Russell Brand in your comedy set because this is slanderous it feels that there was kind of this is complicity too, too strong a word but there was an open secret within the industry about how Russell Brand operated whether that was legal or illegal but nothing was done about it Yeah, I'm, I mean, it's hard to know whether it was a conspiracy or complicity or whether it was just several individuals operating separately. Um, clearly, the longer it went on, I guess, the more people knew about it. I, I certainly didn't know. Um, and so it's possible to have worked in the media and, and not known uh, if you weren't particularly associated with him. I think the story about the researchers, I mean, I do think it's possible that those things are not not conjoined, if you like, that um, Endemol may have wanted to get and Channel 4 may have wanted to get attractive people, young people in the audience because the demographic that they were appealing to on Big Brother was young people. Russell Brand separately obviously was capitalising on the fact that there were attractive young women in the audience. I do think it's outrageous that he asked runners to get their phone numbers or provide him with the hotel room, um, with his hotel room details, and I do think it's bad that those runners did not feel um, that their concerns were taken seriously by the sound of it. Uh, I think this was also in in your story in in the Times uh, last weekend and on the dispatches. Um, you know, effectively they were pimping for Russell Brand, uh, and that's not acceptable. Whatever demographic you're aiming at, or whatever channel you're on. Do you think that the BBC did enough at the time? I mean, you look now through the lens of 2023, I appreciate, at some of the jokes that were made on air and they are deeply, deeply uncomfortable. But, you know, this latest allegation that he exposed himself to a woman working in a BBC building and then went on air and effectively bragged about it. It was a pre-recorded programme. Why was a producer not raising this? Why did an editor stop it being broadcast? It's one thing if it's live, but this was pre-recorded. 
I'm mystified by how he got away with so much for so long, whether it was live on air or pre-recorded on air. Even when you're live, an experienced executive producer will just step in if things are going, uh, you know, beyond the bounds of what's acceptable. Uh, you know, on Radio 2, you can always just play a record uh, so you can have it out while the record's on the air uh, and uh, tell the uh, presenter that, that they need to rein it in. Um, yeah, the story in L.A. is unbelievable. Um, and the fact that, you know, the Channel 4 dispatches called itself In Plain Sight. And that was so appropriate. And the more we learn about these kind of sexual predators, the more we learn that they do operate in plain sight. Jimmy Savile was very similar. I'm not saying Russell Brand has done the same things that Jimmy Savile did. But, you know, it's another example of somebody who transgressed in the most appalling way. Um, and and the fact that Russell Brand seemed to think that he could make jokes of what he was doing to women, which whether the relationship started off as consensual, and it seems that a lot of them did, they then went beyond what those women were comfortable with and beyond what they wanted to agree to. And we heard the story of um, Alice, uh, not her real name, but Alice, um, in, and reported both in the Times and on Channel 4 dispatches, who had to punch Russell Brand in the stomach to stop him choking her. And, you know, I don't think anybody would consent to that. Mm. Is there a case here that the BBC, Channel 4, broadcasters in general, allow presenters to just do what they like because they're the ta talent. I mean, this is always the really weird thing. It's called talent. You know, you have a talent agreement. They are the talent. Are they allowed to just do what they like because they bring the ratings in? And is there just a complete um, lack of backbone to stand up to people? I think there can be. Uh, I mean, I've certainly drawn the line in, with people in my past and there are other people who will have drawn a line. But we do create monsters, um, you know, egos uh, become inflated. People start having outrageous demands. Uh, people start behaving badly, whether it's temper tantrums or sexual misconduct, um, whatever it is. And, you know, I often say it's a bit like with children. You have to draw the line about where they can go and where they can't go. And if you don't do that early on, things rapidly spiral out of control. Everybody knows that it takes a team to make a TV programme or a radio programme. And yes, the on-air talent is an important part of that team, but they're not the only part of that team. And I've also been around long enough to know that uh, nobody is irreplaceable. So you often think, you know, a certain star presenter, what would you do if you lost them? The truth is, you find somebody else. And, you know, we've seen now a lot of people have become hits on YouTube or TikTok without the help of broadcasters. There is a wealth of talent out there who could step into on-screen or on-air talent's places. So I think it's time that everybody realised that they should abide by what we might accept as normal workplace behaviour. Because it is still a workplace, regardless of the fact it might be entertainment. It is still a workplace. Do you think presenters are still being treated in the same way Russell Brand was now. And I'm, I'm not talking about um, necessarily, you know, inappropriate sexual behaviour. What I'm talking about is the power that presenters hold. Do you think they still have that power today in the broadcast industry? I do. I do. But I do think that hopefully people will now speak out. I think one of the difficulties, and this is certainly shown, you know, on, on the Big Brother spin-off show, is that runners are, if you like, at the bottom of the pile. They are people who are just starting out in their career. It would take a huge amount of courage for them to speak out. Um, and they may or may not be listened to. And, you know, they're all freelancers and they're dependent on those people for their patronage, um, for their next jobs, uh, for building their reputations. So, you know, they're, they're in a very tricky situation. And it does sound like the runners made some representations, but those representations were brushed off. And then they probably think, well, you know, I'm only just starting out. Maybe that's what you do in television. Um, but they clearly felt uncomfortable about it. And, it, it, you know, they had a strong moral compass that said to them, this isn't right. Um, it's very difficult if people don't listen. And, you know, there are big imbalances of power in our industry there are imbalances of power between the people who commission the programs, who, if you like, control, 
control the purse strings and the production companies who in some ways are supplicants to those organizations. And, you know, it could be that a broadcaster has suggested you use a presenter and you don't want to say, well, actually, I'm having huge trouble with this presenter. I mean, I would hope now that there is a more of a climate of openness. And I think anybody running a production, running a production company and the commissioners at the broadcasters, everybody shares responsibility in this and they need to be totally allied at the beginning of the production, maybe putting out an overt message, having a meeting, which everybody is present and they say, if you've got complaints, this is the person you report them to. Hopefully somebody outside the chain of command so people will feel comfortable doing that. And um, everybody standing shoulder to shoulder to say, this is what we expect. If you are put in positions where you feel you're uncomfortable, this is who you go to. And finally, what do you think the BBC and Channel 4 should be doing now? Clearly there's investigations going on, but, but what would you like to hear from them? I think they're doing what they can now. You know, I think everybody's taking it seriously. Um, Alex Mahon, the chief executive of Channel 4, Tim Davey, the director general of the BBC, neither of them have brushed these complaints off or these allegations off. They've said they're going to delve into them. I think there will be a clearer code of conduct, if you like, coming out of this. And maybe, you know, I'd like to see some independent whistleblowing system where people can make complaints. Uh, when necessary. Really good to speak to you this morning. Thank you for your time. That's okay. Thank you. Take care. That is Lorraine Hegacy.